Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. So find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice deep breath in. Let it out slowly. And off we go. Tonight, let's return to the world of modern physics with more from the ABC of Relativity by Bertrand Russell, author of The Principles of Mathematics, Proposed Roads to Freedom, and Why Men Fight. First published in 1925 by Harper and Brothers, New York and London. Let's pick up in our explorations right where we left off at Chapter 5. Let's begin. Chapter 5. Space Time. Everybody who has ever heard of relativity knows the phrase space time and knows that the correct thing is to use this phrase when formerly we should have said space and time. But very few people who are not mathematicians have any clear idea of what is meant by this change of phraseology. Before dealing further with the special theory of relativity, I want to try to convey to the reader what is involved in the new phrase space-time, because that is, from a philosophical and imaginative point of view, perhaps the most important of all the novelties that Einstein has introduced. Suppose you wish to say where and when some event has occurred, say an explosion on an airship. You will have to mention four quantities, say the latitude and longitude, the height above the ground, and the time. According to the traditional view, the first three of these give the position in space, while the fourth gives the position in time. The three quantities that give the position in space may be assigned in all sorts of ways. You might, for instance, take the plane of the equator, the plane of the meridian of Greenwich, and the plane of the 90th meridian, and say how far the airship was from each of these planes. These three distances would be what are called Cartesian coordinates, after Descartes. You might take any other three planes, all at right angles to each other, and you would still have Cartesian coordinates. Or you might take the distance from London to a point vertically below the airship. The direction of this distance, northeast, west, southwest, or whatever it may be, and the height of the airship above the ground. There are an infinite number of such ways of fixing the position in space, all equally legitimate. The choice between them is merely one of convenience. When people said that space had three dimensions, they meant just this, that three quantities were necessary in order to specify the position of a point in space, but that the method of assigning these quantities was wholly arbitrary. With regard to time, the matter was thought to be quite different. The only arbitrary elements in the reckoning of time were the unit and the point of time from which the reckoning started. One could reckon in Greenwich time, or in Paris time, or in New York time. That made a difference as to the point of departure. One could reckon in seconds, minutes, hours, days, or years. That was a difference of unit. Both these were obvious and trivial matters. There was nothing corresponding to the liberty of choice, 
as to the method of fixing position in space. And in particular, it was thought that the method of fixing position in space and the method of fixing position in time could be made wholly independent of each other. For these reasons, people regarded time and space as quite distinct. The theory of relativity has changed this. There are now a number of different ways of fixing position in time, which do not differ merely as to the unit and the starting point. Indeed, as we have seen, if one event is simultaneous with another in one reckoning, it will precede it in another and follow it in a third. Moreover, the space and time reckonings are no longer independent of each other. If you alter the way of reckoning position in space, you may also alter the time interval between two events. If you alter the way of reckoning time, you may also alter the distance in space between two events. Thus, space and time are no longer independent any more than the three dimensions of space are. We still need four quantities to determine the position of an event, but we cannot, as before, divide off one of the four as quite independent of the other three. It is not quite true to say that there is no longer any distinction between time and space. As we have seen, there are time-like intervals and space-like intervals, but the distinction is of a different sort from that which was formerly assumed. There is no longer a universal time which can be applied without ambiguity to any part of the universe. There are only the various proper times of the various bodies in the universe, which agree approximately for two bodies which are not in rapid relative motion, but never agree exactly, except for two bodies which are at rest relatively to each other. The picture of the world which is required for this new state of affairs is as follows. Suppose an event E occurs to me, and simultaneously a flash of light goes out from me in all directions. Anything that happens to any body after the light from the flash has reached it is definitely after the event E in any system of reckoning time. Any event anywhere, which I could have seen before the event E occurred to me, is definitely before the event E in any system of reckoning time. But any event which happened in the intervening time is not definitely either before or after the event E. To make the matter definite, suppose I could observe a person in Sirius, and he could observe me. Anything which he does, and which I see before the event E occurs to me, is definitely before E. Anything he does after he has seen the event E is definitely after E but anything that he does before he sees the event E, but so that I see it after the event E has happened, is not definitely before or after E. Since light takes many years to travel from Sirius to the Earth, this gives a period of twice as many years in Sirius, which may be called contemporary with E, since these years are not definitely before or after E. Dr. A. A. Robb, in his Theory of Time and Space, suggests a point of view which may or may not be philosophically fundamental, but is at any rate a help in understanding the state of affairs we have been describing. He maintains that one event can only be said to be definitely before another if it can influence that other in some way. 
Now influences spread from a center at varying rates. Newspapers exercise an influence emanating from London at an average rate of about 20 miles an hour, rather more for long distances. Anything a man does because of what he reads in the newspaper is clearly subsequent to the printing of the newspaper. Sound travels much faster. It would be possible to arrange a series of loudspeakers along the main roads and have newspapers shouted from each to the next, but telegraphing is quicker, and wireless telegraphy travels with the velocity of light so that nothing quicker can ever be hoped for. Now what a man does in consequence of receiving a wireless message, he does after the message was sent. The meaning here is quite independent of conventions as to the measurement of time. But anything that he does while the message is on its way cannot be influenced by the sending of the message and cannot influence the sender until some little time after he sent the message. That is to say, if two bodies are widely separated, neither can influence the other except after a certain lapse of time. What happens before that time has elapsed cannot affect the distant body. Suppose, for instance, that some notable event happens on the sun. There is a period of 16 minutes on the earth during which no event on the earth can have influenced or been influenced by the said notable event on the sun. This gives a substantial ground for regarding that period of 16 minutes on the earth as neither before nor after the event on the sun. The paradoxes of the special theory of relativity are only paradoxes because we are unaccustomed to the point of view and in the habit of taking things for granted when we have no right to do so. This is especially true as regards the measurement of lengths. In daily life, our way of measuring lengths is to apply a foot rule or some other measure. At the moment when the foot rule is applied, it is at rest relatively to the body which is being measured. Consequently, the length that we arrive at by measurement is the proper length. That is to say, the length as estimated by an observer who shares the motion of the body. We never in ordinary life have to tackle the problem of measuring a body which is in continual motion. And even if we did, the velocities of visible bodies on the Earth are so small relatively to the Earth that the anomalies dealt with by the theory of relativity would not appear. But in astronomy, or in the investigation of atomic structure, we are faced with problems which cannot be tackled in this way. Not being Joshua, we cannot make the sun stand still while we measure it. If we are to estimate its size, we must do so while it is in motion relatively to us. And similarly, if you want to estimate the size of an electron, you have to do so while it is in rapid motion, because it never stands still for a moment. This is the sort of problem with which the theory of relativity is concerned. Measurement with a foot rule, when it is possible, gives always the same result, because it gives the proper length of a body. But when this method is not possible, we find that curious things happen, particularly if the body to be measured is moving very fast relatively to the observer. A figure like the one at the end of the previous chapter will help us to understand the state of affairs. Let us suppose that the body on which we wish to measure lengths is moving relatively to ourselves, and that in one second it moves the distance OM. Let us draw a circle round O, 
whose radius is the distance that light travels in a second. Through M, draw MP perpendicular to OM, meeting the circle in P. Thus, OP is the distance that light travels in a second. The ratio of OP to OM is the ratio of the velocity of light to the velocity of the body. The ratio of OP to MP is the ratio in which apparent lengths are altered by the motion. That is to say, if the observer judges that two points in the line of motion on the moving body are at a distance from each other represented by MP, a person moving with the body would judge that they were at a distance represented on the same scale by OP. Distances on the moving body at right angles to the line of motion are not affected by the motion. The whole thing is reciprocal. That is to say, if an observer moving with the body were to measure lengths on the previous observer's body, they would be altered in just the same proportion. When two bodies are moving relatively to each other, lengths on either appear shorter to the other than to themselves. This is the Fitzgerald contraction, which was first invented to account for the result of the Michelson-Morley experiment, but it now emerges naturally from the fact that the two observers do not make the same judgment of simultaneity. The way in which simultaneity comes in is this. We say that two points on a body are a foot apart when we can simultaneously apply one end of a foot rule to the one and the other end to the other. If now two people disagree about simultaneity and the body is in motion, they will obviously get different results from their measurements. Thus the trouble about time is at the bottom of the trouble about distance. The ratio of OP to MP is the essential thing in all these matters. Times and lengths and masses are all altered in this proportion when the body concerned is in motion relatively to the observer. It will be seen that if OM is very much smaller than OP, that is to say, if the body is moving very much more slowly than light, MP and OP are very nearly equal, so that the alterations produced by the motion are very small. But if OM is nearly as large as OP, that is to say, if the body is moving nearly as fast as light, MP becomes very small compared to OP and the effects become very great. The apparent increase of mass in swiftly moving particles has been observed, and the right formula had been found before Einstein invented his special theory of relativity. In fact, Lorentz had arrived at the formulae called the Lorentz transformation, which embody the whole mathematical essence of the special theory of relativity. But it was Einstein who showed that the whole thing was what we ought to have expected, and not a set of makeshift devices to account for surprising experimental results. Nevertheless, it must not be forgotten that experimental results were the original motive of the whole theory, and have remained the ground for undertaking the tremendous logical reconstruction involved in Einstein's theories. We may now recapitulate the reasons which have made it necessary to substitute space-time for space and time. The old separation of space and time rested upon the belief that there was no ambiguity in saying that two events in distant places happened at the same time. Consequently, it was thought that we could describe the topography of the universe at a given instant in purely spatial terms. 
but now that simultaneity has become relative to a particular observer, this is no longer possible. What is, for one observer, a description of the state of the world at a given instant, is, for another observer, a series of events at various different times, whose relations are not merely spatial, but also temporal. For the same reason we are concerned with events, rather than with bodies. In the old theory, it was possible to consider a number of bodies all at the same instant, and since the time was the same for all of them, it could be ignored. But now we cannot do that if we are to obtain an objective account of physical occurrences. We must mention the date at which a body is to be considered, and thus we arrive at an event, that is to say, something which happens at a given time. When we know the time and place of an event, in one observer's system of reckoning, we can calculate its time and place according to another observer. But we must know the time as well as the place, because we can no longer ask what is its place for the new observer at the same time as for the old observer. There is no such thing as the same time for different observers, unless they are at rest relatively to each other. We need four measurements to fix a position, and four measurements fix the position of an event in space-time, not merely of a body in space. Three measurements are not enough to fix any position. That is the essence of what is meant by the substitution of space-time for space and time. Chapter 6 The Special Theory of Relativity The special theory of relativity arose as a way of accounting for the facts of electromagnetism. We have here a somewhat curious history. In the 18th and early 19th centuries, the theory of electricity was wholly dominated by the Newtonian analogy. Two electric charges attract each other if they are of different kinds, one positive and one negative, but repel each other if they are of the same kind. In each case, the force varies as the inverse square of the distance, as in the case of gravitation. This force was conceived as an action at a distance, until Faraday, by a number of remarkable experiments, demonstrated the effect of the intervening medium. Faraday was no mathematician. Clark Maxwell first gave a mathematical form to the results, suggested by Faraday's experiments. Moreover, Clark Maxwell gave grounds for thinking that light is an electromagnetic phenomenon, consisting of electromagnetic waves. The medium for the transmission of electromagnetic effects could therefore be taken to be the ether, which had long been assumed for the transmission of light. The correctness of Maxwell's theory of light was proved by the experiments of Hertz in manufacturing electromagnetic waves. These experiments afforded the basis for wireless telegraphy. So far, we have a record of triumphant progress in which theory and experiment alternately assume the leading role. At the time of Hertz's experiments, the ether seemed securely established and in just as strong a position as any other scientific hypothesis not capable of direct verification. But a new set of facts began to be discovered, and gradually the whole picture was changed. The movement which culminated with Hertz was a movement for making everything continuous. The ether was continuous. The waves in it were continuous. 
and it was hoped that matter would be found to consist of some continuous structure in the ether. Then came the discovery of the electron, a small finite unit of negative electricity, and the proton, a small finite unit of positive electricity. The most modern view is that electricity is never found except in the form of electrons and protons. All electrons have the same amount of negative electricity, and all protons have an exactly equal and opposite amount of positive electricity. It appeared that an electric current, which had been thought of as a continuous phenomenon, consists of electrons traveling one way and positive ions traveling the other way. It is no more strictly continuous than the stream of people going up and down an escalator. Then came the discovery of quanta, which seems to show a fundamental discontinuity in all such natural processes as can be measured with sufficient precision. Thus physics has had to digest new facts and face new problems. But the problems raised by the electron and the quantum are not those that the theory of relativity can solve, at any rate at present. As yet, it throws no light upon the discontinuities which exist in nature. The problems solved by the special theory of relativity are typified by the michelson morley experiment. Assuming the correctness of Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, there should have been certain discoverable effects of motion through the ether. In fact, there were none. Then there was the observed fact that a body in very rapid motion appears to increase its mass. The increase is in the ratio of OP to MP in the figure in the preceding chapter. Facts of this sort gradually accumulated until it became imperative to find some theory which would account for them all. Maxwell's theory reduced itself to certain equations, known as Maxwell's equations. Through all the revolutions which physics has undergone in the last 50 years, these equations have remained standing. Indeed, they have continually grown in importance as well as in certainty. For Maxwell's arguments in their favor were so shaky that the correctness of his results must also be ascribed to intuition. Now these equations were, of course, obtained from experiments in terrestrial laboratories, but there was a tacit assumption that the motion of the Earth through the ether could be ignored. In certain cases, such as the Michelson-Morley experiment, this ought not to have been possible without measurable error, but it turned out to be always possible. Physicists were faced with the odd difficulty that Maxwell's equations were more accurate than they should be. A very similar difficulty was explained by Galileo at the very beginning of modern physics. Most people think that if you let a weight drop, it will fall vertically. But if you try the experiment in the cabin of a moving ship, the weight falls in relation to the cabin, just as if the ship were at rest. For instance, if it starts from the middle of the ceiling, it will drop onto the middle of the floor. That is to say, from the point of view of an observer on the shore, it does not fall vertically, since it shares the motion of the ship. So long as the ship's motion is steady, everything goes on inside the ship as if the ship were not moving. Galileo explained how this happens, to the great indignation of the disciples of Aristotle. In orthodox physics, which is derived from Galileo, a uniform motion in a straight line has no discoverable effects. 
this was in its day as astonishing a form of relativity as that of Einstein is to us. Einstein, in the special theory of relativity, set to work to show how electromagnetic phenomena could be unaffected by uniform motion through the ether, if there be an ether. This was a more difficult problem, which could not be solved by merely adhering to the principles of Galileo. The really difficult effort required for solving this problem was in regard to time. It was necessary to introduce the notion of proper time, which we have already considered, and to abandon the old belief in one universal time. The quantitative laws of electromagnetic phenomena are expressed in Maxwell's equations, and these equations are found to be true for any observer, however he may be moving. It is a straightforward mathematical problem to find out what differences there must be between the measures applied by one observer and the measures applied by another. If, in spite of their relative motion, they are to find the same equations verified, the answer is contained in the Lorentz transformation, found as a formula by Lorentz, but interpreted and made intelligible by Einstein. The Lorentz transformation tells us what estimate of distances and periods of time will be made by an observer whose relative motion is known when we are given those of another observer. We may suppose that you are in a train on a railway which travels due east. You have been traveling for a time which, by the clocks at the station from which you started, is T, at a distance X from your starting point, as measured by the people on the line, an event occurs at this moment. Say, the line is struck by lightning. You have been traveling all the time with a uniform velocity, V. The question is, how far from you will you judge that this event has taken place, and how long after you started will it be by your watch, assuming that your watch is correct from the point of view of an observer on the train? Our solution of this problem has to satisfy certain conditions. It has to bring out the result that the velocity of light is the same for all observers, however they may be moving, and it has to make physical phenomena, in particular those of electromagnetism, obey the same laws for different observers, however they may find their measures of distances and times affected by their motion, and it has to make all such effects on measurement reciprocal. That is to say, if you are in a train, and your motion affects your estimate of distances outside the train, there must be an exactly similar change in the estimate which people outside the train make of distances inside it. These conditions are sufficient to determine the solution of the problem, but the method of obtaining the solution cannot be explained without more mathematics than is possible in the present work. Before dealing with the matter in general terms, let us take an example. Let us suppose that you are in a train on a long straight railway, and that you are traveling at three-fifths of the velocity of light. Suppose that you measure the length of your train, and find that it is a hundred yards, Suppose that the people who catch a glimpse of you as you pass succeed by skillful scientific methods in taking observations which enable them to calculate the length of your train. If they do their work correctly, they will find that it is 80 yards long. Everything in the train will seem to them shorter in the direction of the train than it does to you. 
dinner plates, which you see as ordinary circular plates, will look to the outsider as if they were oval. They will seem only four-fifths as broad in the direction in which the train is moving as in the direction of the breadth of the train. And all this is reciprocal. Suppose you see out of the window a man carrying a fishing rod, which by his measurement is fifteen feet long. If he is holding it upright, you will see it as he does. So you will if he is holding it horizontally at right angles to the railway. But if he is pointing it along the railway, it will seem to you to be only twelve feet long. All lengths in the direction of motion are diminished by 20%, both for those who look into the train from outside and for those who look out from the train inside. But the effects in regard to time are even more strange. This matter has been explained with almost ideal lucidity by Eddington in Space, Time, and Gravitation, he supposes an aviator traveling, relatively to the Earth, at a speed of 161,000 miles a second, and he says, quote, If we observed the aviator carefully, we should infer that he was unusually slow in his movements, and events in the conveyance moving with him would be similarly retarded, as though time had forgotten to go on. His cigar lasts twice as long as one of ours. I said, infer deliberately. We should see a still more extravagant slowing down of time. But that is easily explained, because the aviator is rapidly increasing his distance from us, and the light impressions take longer and longer to reach us. The more moderate retardation referred to remains after we have allowed for the time of transmission of light. But here again, reciprocity comes in, because in the aviator's opinion, it is we who are traveling at 161,000 miles a second past him. And when he has made all allowances, he finds that it is we who are sluggish. Our cigar lasts twice as long as his. End quote. What a situation for envy. Each man thinks that the other's cigar lasts twice as long as his own. It may, however, be some consolation to reflect that the other man's visits to the dentist also last twice as long. This question of time is rather intricate owing to the fact that events which one man judges to be simultaneous, another considers to be separated by a lapse of time. In order to try to make clear how time is affected, I shall revert to our railway train traveling due east at a rate three-fifths of that of light. For the sake of illustration, I assume that the earth is large and flat, instead of small and round. If we take events which happen at a fixed point on the earth and ask ourselves how long after the beginning of the journey they will seem to be to the traveler, the answer is that there will be that retardation that Eddington speaks of, which means in this case that what seems an hour in the life of the stationary person is judged to be an hour and a quarter by the man who observes him from the train. Reciprocally, what seems an hour in the life of the person in the train is judged by the man observing him from outside to be an hour and a quarter. Each makes periods of time observed in the life of the other a quarter as long again as they are to the person who lives through them. The proportion is the same in regard to times as in regard to lengths. But when, instead of comparing events at the same place on the earth, 
we compare events at widely separated places, the results are still more odd. Let us now take all the events along the railway, which, from the point of view of a person who is stationary on the earth, happen at a given instant. Say, the instant when the observer in the train passes the stationary person. Of these events, those which occur at points towards which the train is moving will seem to the traveler to have already happened, while those which occur at points behind the train will, for him, be still in the future. When I say that events in the forward direction will seem to have already happened, I am saying something not strictly accurate, because he will not yet have seen them. But when he does see them, he will, after allowing for the velocity of light, come to the conclusion that they must have happened before the moment in question. An event which happens in the forward direction along the railway, and which the stationary observer judges to be now, or rather, will judge to have been now when he comes to know of it, if it occurs at a distance along the line which light could travel in a second, will be judged by the traveler to have occurred three quarters of a second ago. If it occurs at a distance from the two observers, which the man on the earth judges that light could travel in a year, the traveler will judge, when he comes to know of it, that it occurred nine months earlier than the moment when he passed the earth dweller and generally he will antedate events in the forward direction along the railway by three quarters of the time that it would take light to travel from them to the man on the earth whom he is just passing and who holds that these events are happening now or rather will hold that they happened now when the light from them reaches him. Events happening on the railway behind the train will be post-dated by an equally exact amount. We have thus a twofold correction to make in the date of an event when we pass from the terrestrial observer to the traveler. We must first take five-fourths of the time as estimated by the earth-dweller, and then subtract three-fourths of the time that it would take light to travel from the event in question to the Earth-dweller. Take some event in a distant part of the universe, which becomes visible to the Earth-dweller and the Traveler just as they pass each other. The Earth-dweller, if he knows how far off the event occurred, can judge how long ago it occurred since he knows the speed of light. If the event occurred in the direction towards which the traveler is moving, the traveler will infer that it happened twice as long ago as the earth dweller thinks. But if it occurred in the direction from which he has come, he will argue that it happened only half as long ago as the earth dweller thinks. If the traveler moves at a different speed, these proportions will be different. Suppose now that, as sometimes occurs, two new stars have suddenly flared up and have just become visible to the traveler and to the earth dweller whom he is passing. Let one of them be in the direction towards which the train is traveling and the other in the direction from which it has come. Suppose that the Earth Dweller is able, in some way, to estimate the distance of the two stars, and to infer that light takes fifty years to reach him from the one, in the direction towards which the Traveler is moving, and one hundred years to reach him from the other. He will then argue that the explosion which produced the new star in the forward direction occurred fifty years ago while the explosion which produced the other new star occurred a hundred years ago. The traveler will exactly reverse these figures. He will infer that the forward explosion occurred a hundred years ago, and the backward one fifty years ago. 
I assume that both argue correctly on correct physical data. In fact, both are right, unless they imagine that the other must be wrong. It should be noted that both will have the same estimate of the velocity of light, because their estimates of the distances of the two new stars will vary in exactly the same proportion as their estimates of the time since the explosions. Indeed, one of the main motives of this whole theory is to secure that the velocity of light shall be the same for all observers, however they may be moving. This fact, established by experiment, was incompatible with the old theories and made it absolutely necessary to admit something startling. The theory of relativity is just as little startling as is compatible with the facts. Indeed, after a time, it ceases to be startling at all. There is another feature of very great importance in the theory we have been considering, and that is that... Although distances and times vary for different observers, we can derive from them the quantity called interval, which is the same for all observers. The interval in the special theory of relativity is obtained as follows. Take the square of the distance between two events, and the square of the distance traveled by light in the time between the two events. Subtract the lesser of these from the greater, and the result is defined as the square of the interval between the events. The interval is the same for all observers, and represents a genuine physical relation between the two events, which the time and the distance do not. We have already given a geometrical construction for the interval at the end of chapter 4. This gives the same result as the above rule. The interval is time-like, when the time between the events is longer than light would take to travel from the place of the one to the place of the other. In the contrary case, it is space-like. When the time between the two events is exactly equal to the time taken by light to travel from one to the other, the interval is zero. The two events are then situated on parts of one light ray, unless no light happens to be passing that way. When we come to the general theory of relativity, we shall have to generalize the notion of interval. The more deeply we penetrate into the structure of the world, the more important this concept becomes. We are tempted to say, that it is the reality of which distances and periods of time are confused representations. The theory of relativity has altered our view of the fundamental structure of the world. That is the source both of its difficulty and of its importance. The remainder of this chapter may be omitted by readers who have not even the most elementary acquaintance with geometry or algebra, but for the benefit of those whose education has not been entirely neglected, I will add a few explanations of the general formula, of which I have hitherto given only particular examples. The general formula in question is the Lorentz transformation, which tells when one body is moving in a given manner relatively to another, how to infer the measures of lengths and times appropriate to the one body from those appropriate to the other. Before giving the algebraical formulae, I will give a geometrical construction. As before, we will suppose that there are two observers whom we will call O and O1, one of whom is stationary on the earth while the other is traveling at a uniform speed along a straight railway. At the beginning of the time considered, the two observers were at the same point of the railway, 
but now they are separated by a certain distance. A flash of lightning strikes a point X on the railway, and O judges that at the moment when the flash takes place, the observer in the train has reached the point O1. The problem is, how far will O1 judge that he is from the flash? And how long after the beginning of the journey, when he was at O, will he judge that the flash took place? We are supposed to know O's estimates, and we want to calculate those of O1. In the time that, according to O, has elapsed since the beginning of the journey, let OC be the distance that light would have traveled along the railway. Describe a circle about O with OC as radius, and through O1 draw a perpendicular to the railway, meeting the circle in D. On OD, take a point Y, such that OY is equal to OX. X is the point of the railway where the lightning strikes. Draw YM perpendicular to the railway, and OS perpendicular to OD. Let YM and OS meet in S. Also, let DO1 produced and OS produced meet in R. Through X and C, draw perpendiculars to the railway meeting OS produced in Q and Z respectively. Then RQ, as measured by O, is the distance at which O1 will believe himself to be from the flash, not O1X, as it would be according to the old view. And whereas O thinks that, in the time from the beginning of the journey to the flash, light would travel a distance OC, O1 thinks that the time elapsed is that required for light to travel the distance SZ, as measured by O. The interval, as measured by O, is got by subtracting the square on OX from the square on OC. The interval, as measured by O1, is got by subtracting the square on RQ from the square on SZ. A little very elementary geometry shows that these are equal. The algebraic formulae embodied in the above construction are shown as follows. This is the Lorentz transformation from which everything in this chapter can be deduced. And good luck with that, everyone. Since we've reached the end of Chapter 6, I think we'll also end this evening's reading from the ABC of Relativity by Bertrand Russell. I think I'm getting closer to understanding the specifics here, but I'm not quite sure. Regardless, I hope you enjoyed that. If you'd like to read this work for yourself and see the diagrams and equations described, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, or request more from one we've already started, you can drop me an email via our website, www.boringbookspod.com. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night.